Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to another module 10 problem. Again, two population means one tail, sigma known. Okay, we get it, but let's make sure we can figure that out for ourselves. So let's just get into this problem. It is very, very similar to problem 101A. So we'll make sure that we can go through this problem and we know exactly what we're supposed to do based on the information that is there. And then you'll see, my goodness, the process of this test is so similar to the ones that you've already done before. Let's get into it. Many students, many students, tend to choose courses based on which professor gives the easiest marks. One seems pretty certain that Prof. Daly is much easier than Prof. Fraser. Okay, so I'm Prof. Daly. Prof. Fraser, that's actually named after my fiance. Maybe wife by the time you watch this video. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see how things go. In order to test this claim, you talk with other students who have taken the course with each of them. After talking with 41 of Prof. Daly's past students, you find the average grade was 73.2. You talk with 49 of Prof. Fraser's past students and calculate their average grade to be 66.4. Assume that we know the population standard deviation of Prof. Daly's to be this and Prof. Fraser's to be that. Okay, how do we know what we're doing? Well, it's describing two samples, right? I've got uh, 41 of Prof. Daly's with an average grade of 73.2. I have 49 of Prof. Fraser's with an average grade of 66. And I have two standard deviations. So it's describing to us two samples. So that's how I know that when I formulate this test, that's how I know I'm working with two populations. I also know I'm working with averages, not proportions or anything else. Well, because it says average. So that's fairly straightforward. I'm not going to put in the subscripts here yet. I'm just going to put in some of the notation. Now, what is it that we're testing for? So one student is really certain that Prof. Daly is much easier than Prof. Fraser. So what does that mean? Here our data is measured in grades. So to determine whether one is easier than the other, sounds like we're testing to see that one has a higher average than the other. The, you're more likely to get a higher grade maybe in one class as opposed to the other. So much easier, we're looking in grades. So it sounds to me like I wanna see that the grades offered by one instructor is greater than the grades offered by another instructor. There's no information here given about any particular magnitude of a difference, just that one is easier than the other. One has higher grades than the other. So I'm gonna set this up whoops, as a upper tail test. And again, because my hypothesized difference is zero, I'm just gonna write it like this. And I'm not even gonna worry about including that zero, right? Just, just so that I don't confuse anybody, right? We would often write the difference value. And then here I'd have that hypothesized zero. Just to clean it up, I'm gonna write it like this. Then I need to make sure I define my terms properly. Prof. Daly is easier than Prof. Fraser. That's the same as Prof. Daly gets higher grades than Prof. Fraser. So this is going to be Daly and this is going to be Fraser. Justify our formulation. Well, I formulated it this way so that if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, that then supports this student's claim that on average, grades are higher in Prof. Daly's class than in Prof. Fraser's class. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, well then we cannot support that claim. We're unable to say that the grades are higher in Prof. Daly's class as opposed or as compared to Professor Fraser's class. We're doing this at the O 
three a level of significance. So again, we kind of get into this routine of doing these tests at the 5% level of significance. So we have to make sure that we watch out for any little changes that happen. Okay, now that's really the hard part. Formulating the test, believe it or not, maybe at this point it, it doesn't seem as difficult, I hope, but more often than not, that first step, formulating the test, can be one of the more difficult ones because formulating the test relies so much on just having a good understanding of what you're being told. Once you've got that figured out, well, now it's just formulas, calculations, and looking at distribution tables. Not to say that it's easy, but it's a little bit more straightforward and a little bit more prescribed. So our test statistic, again, we have sigmas. It tells us population, standard deviation. So I know I'm doing a Z test because I know I'm working with the population standard deviation. And so our formula, X bar one, X bar two, that hypothesized difference and our standard error. Oops, there's a good mistake to make. And one and two. Now, I, again, I have to make sure that the way I, I input my values into that formula are consistent with how I've defined them. So Dali is population number one. Fraser is population number two because these tests are always one minus two. So by formulating it the way that I have, I have implicitly defined population one is Dali, two is Fraser. So where are my averages? So the Prof Dali's average is 73.2. Fraser's is 66.4. Our hypothesized difference here is zero, once again, because we're not being given any specific magnitude of a difference. We're just testing to see if one is greater than the other, okay? And then down here, so now I've been given standard deviations. Unlike problem 10.1a, it gave us variances where we would just input those variances into our formula, now we're given standard deviations. So now I have to make sure that I square them. Now, this also is a little bit of a trick here because here I have the averages are given to us as a whole number, as a percentage, 66.4, 73.2. Our standard deviations, that's a little bit tricky. They're given to us as a decimal. I'm going to convert those so that I'm working with all the same values. So for Dali, that's going to be 14 squared, 14%. And my sample size for Dali is here, 41. And then for Fraser, again, that's going to be 18 over the sample size of Fraser's. Here is 49. Okay, let me just scroll down. So that's going to give me 73.2 minus 66.4 divided by over 41 plus 18 over 49. That gives me 2.0, and I'll round up to 2.02 if I keep it to two decimal places. Now it's all the same. Isn't this getting repetitive? Doesn't it get redundant? This process, it's all very much the same. I'm doing an upper tail test. I'm gonna scroll down to my Z tables. I'm gonna take advantage of the symmetry. I talked about this a little bit more in the previous video, so I won't get into it here. But there's 2.02. .02. There's that probability, 0 0.02. Let's round it to 2. And so, once again, this is a one-tail test. 
So that is my p-value, meaning I don't have to multiply it by 2, right? If it were a two-tailed test, I'd multiply it by 2. It is not, so that gives me my p-value. Now, let's do the critical value approach because we have a different level of significance, one that we haven't used. So let's just make sure we can find that in our tables. So I'm looking for alpha is 0 0.03. And so when I come down to my tables, I'm looking for 0 0.03, and I see it oh, right about there is about as close as we're going to get to 0 0.03. So there's my critical value, 1.88. So once again, we see that we are getting here consistent results. Again, I'll draw the picture. I really got to stop doing this. I don't normally do this with all of the problems. We have a critical value here of 1.88. That defines where we will reject and consequently where we will not reject. That gives us an area in that upper tail of 0 0.03. We have a test statistic, 2.02. .02. And so, no surprises. That p-value, the blue area, is smaller than the red area. We get consistent results. Both of these results are telling us that we are, oh my gosh, what a mistake that we do reject. Our test statistic is larger than the critical value. Our p-value is smaller than the level of significance. Everything here is telling us to reject that null hypothesis. Our evidence supports the alternative. We do have sufficient evidence to show that on average, the grades in Professor Daly's classes are greater than those in Professor Fraser's classes. We could maybe interpret that as though Professor Daly is easier than Professor Fraser. Don't let her hear me say that. Okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. Again, you've got to see how similar everything that we're doing here is to problems that we have already done. Small little differences come up, and so you have to make sure that you don't get into a routine, you don't get into a habit, and so you spot those little differences and you make the necessary adjustments. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.